In the book, The Rescue Artist, the author takes us to Oslo, Norway. At 6.29 a.m., February 12, 1994. That morning, this is what the Oslo police found outside the Oslo National Gallery. And this is what they did not find inside. One of their most valuable pieces, the screen by Munk, had been stolen. He follows in the book all the steps taken to recover this masterpiece all the way to the afternoon of May 7th, 1994. And this describes a collaborative effort from Scotland Yard, the Norway police, including undercover agents, to finally recover this piece. He writes the book and publishes in 2005. Now his afterword in the book explains that he is just delivered the manuscript for publication in 2004 when he listens to the news from Oslo, Norway, the morning of 22nd of August, 2004. The scream by Munk has been stolen from the Munk Museum. Well, you can imagine, his response to this, his reaction. Uh, he had just delivered a book that culminated with the successful recovery of the work. And now he's just listening in and he can't believe that the screen by Munch was stolen. Now, if you were paying attention, the news from Oslo, Norway said the Munch Museum. And his, his book refers to the screen by Munch in the National Gallery. Did they make a mistake? Well, this is the screen by Munk in the Munk Museum. So it was not the previous painting that he described, the one that was stolen in 2004, but neither was this one. This is the other version of the screen by Munk in the Munk Museum. And this is the one that was stolen in 2004. How many versions of the scream did Munk create? As far as I can tell, there's at least these four paintings. Plus, there are several sketches and many lithographs. All are original Munk works. So when you're trying to identify, like the art detective, a work by Munk or this work by Munk that has been stolen, you know that there's many different variations of this particular work and you need to know how to identify them. Perhaps the most telling characteristic of this particular painting is the screaming face. So if you actually know that face and you know how Munk painted it, you'll be able to identify any potential variations of this particular work that could be stolen and you are the art detective trying to find it. Is that true? Well, spot the face. If you're just looking at the face, you won't find it. So the art detectives have many different disciplines. They can come from police work, they can be formal detectives, they can be chemists, they can be forensic pathologists, they can be historians, they can be art historians. So there's many different backgrounds that have to combine to create a better team because what they need to target is all the potential real works by Munch that could have variations. And these are the ones that we know of that have been published, but who knows, there might be another original Munch with another variation that's as valuable and as original as the others. So these people need to really know, and how do they do? How do they really know that this would be a real Munch or not when a, another variation appears? Well, they know all the characteristics of the painting, not just the screaming face, but all the other elements of the painting. They also do a lot of research. They go through uh, books on uh, the catalogs of the known works, but they also go through the sketches and they go through letters, documentation, so that they can actually find if there are more descriptions of works of Munch that 
may not be known. They may be in private collections. They also can do a lot of chemical testings for not only the age of the materials, but also the type of materials that have been used. Is this a type of paint that Munch was using or the surface where he painted? He was very well known for painting a lot on cardboard and paper and different kinds of surfaces. And also uh, they can do imaging, not only x-rays, but a lot of different kinds of imaging now that are able to identify the work of master. So let's take a look at the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. The coronavirus spike protein is the key protein of the virus that provides the infectivity of the virus. And you can see in the two publications I have listed here below, uh, it's not a mistake that the first one is 2005. Coronaviruses have been known for decades. And the description of the importance of the spike protein into providing the virus with the ability to infect and cause disease has been already known. So in my example, let's say that the spike protein is the key that we need to recognize. Within the spike protein, there's a domain called the receptor binding domain. And that's really the one that provides the virus with being more infective or less infective. So in a way, the receptor binding domain would be like having the face the screaming phase to identify the work of MUNC. If we only identify the receptor binding domain, there may actually be some spike protein changes characteristic of other coronaviruses that may not be causing disease. So this is, in my example, like the fake. If you don't know the whole structure of the painting and you don't know that there's only three figures in every one of his examples, uh, you would not know which one is the fake that has an additional figure in there. So by just identifying the receptor binding domain, uh, your immune system might be identifying potential coronaviruses that I call would be the fakes or they would not really be SARS-CoV-2 because they do have a different structure. So in this paper, um, you can actually see the different families of coronavirus and they go on to explain the different genetic um, encoding or codifications for the different variants of the viruses. What you see here is in blue, you have the SARS-CoV, which was the first one described, and the MERS-CoV. SARS refers to serious acute respiratory syndrome, and MERS was a variant found in the Middle East. More recently, we all have heard about SARS-CoV-2. The family is all the same. They all belong to the beta coronavirus, but not all beta coronaviruses have caused uh, human disease. And furthermore, the alpha, delta, and gamma families of coronaviruses have not yet been described as causing any serious infectious disease in humans. So when we are telling the immune system to identify the SARS-CoV-2 with all the potential variants is, in my example, as identifying all the original works of art by Munch that are called the screen. So what we need to know is that we can identify the whole spike protein that belongs to those coronavirus, not just the receptor binding site, which would be just the screaming phase, but we need to know all the other structures that include the different variants in the virus, and that corresponds to the different versions of the painting that Munch painted. So now this is the first version of this painting by Munch. It's in his sketchbook a year before the first known painting and sketch. So a year before he scribbles this and he sketches in his diary, what really caught his attention and it's very clear from, from his handwritten version in watercolor in the 1930s was the red blood color of the sky. And 
from there on, all, all of these versions are going to have that characteristic red sky. In real life, what he felt at the beginning was a sense of despair. And that's what you see in his first image. But very soon he changed it to the screaming face. Monk is a master of depicting human emotions. And you can see on the first one, he's leaning over the rails. He has stopped walking with his friends because he has to hold on to the railings. He's in despair because of the feeling and the reaction he had to that incredible sky. He changed that to a more active emotion of terror in the second one that has become the trademark of this painting. So even though at first he felt completely out of control and he felt vulnerable, after that first feeling, he felt it was more important to show the terror that he felt with that red sky. And that's what we know better of the versions of his work. However, the first one is also an original monk. And if you can see, that red sky always was retained in all of his versions. So now the art detectives need to also be able to identify versions that may not have the screaming face. And if they only knew the elements that include the screaming face, they could miss actually that one. So they would need to know that one. However, there may be originals in somebody's attic or you know somebody's private collection that we don't know of. And you may not know all of the elements of that particular design. However, if you do all the other testing and you do the chemical testings and you do your research and you look at the provenance, you will be able to identify new potential variations of the painting, also originals by Munch that may have a slightly different design. So how do we know that we have the spike protein and now there might be variants and these are not now belonging to fakes. These variants are actually variants from the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. So, same as the art detectives were able to have an arsenal of technologies to identify an, a real MOOC, we need to make sure that our immune system can identify the variants as true variants and not what I call fakes which would be the non-SARS-CoV-2 viruses. When it comes to SARS-CoV-2, the art detectives are the immune system cells. What are they targeting? The original virus and all the potential pathogenic variants. The original virus is also known as the wild type, the first one that was described, and the variants would be the ones that cause disease. We don't really care about the ones that will not be causing disease, but we want our immune system to identify all of them. Same as the art detectives need to identify all of the original works by Munk and not fakes. So how does the immune system know? So how do cells in the immune system work? Uh, think about an orchestra. An orchestra has many different kinds of instruments and they're classified in types and subtypes. For instance, you have the wind instruments, but within the wind instrument, they can be wood or they can be metal. And they're positioned in a different place in the orchestra, same as the chord instruments or you have the percussion instruments. So each one of them has a place, physical place, and also they have to work under a good coordination. And that's where the conductor comes in. The conductor of the immune system is the T cell. And not everybody has a von Karajan, which is the picture that I chose here as a conductor, 
uh, should we be that lucky, but we cannot choose our immune system. So some orchestra conductors are better than others, and some orchestras are better than others, and that's what happens with the immune system. Orchestras also can switch membership and they can occasionally get the best players all together, but sometimes they may actually have a, a different response and it's the same orchestra with the same conductor. That can happen. Sometimes we have a good response, sometimes we have a not so good response, and it's our same immune system. Now, um, the other thing that's important here is that the orchestras can adapt and the immune system also has that ability to adapt. What I mean is orchestras can play in different kinds of halls, music halls, and they have different acoustics. But for the best outcome, they train. They need to make sure that they understand the acoustics. And sometimes they may even change certain positions of the orchestra players. So this has to be coordinated. They have to rehearse and they have to do not only have the knowledge but understand the conditions where they're working on so the immune system actually has to do the same uh, not every time you encounter SARS-CoV-2 in this example it's going to be the same situation and your immune system needs to adapt and needs to know how to respond so the other characteristic of the immune system is the ability to memorize in other words, the immune system, once it has mounted an immune response, it retains the memory of how that, in, in this case, how that SARS-CoV-2 virus looks like. And it will very quickly block the infection if we get uh, in touch with that virus again. And in a way, it's like an orchestra. The best orchestras, I mean, they can memorize several pieces, especially as years go by. Some orchestras are well known by the way that they um, perform a particular piece. Now, if they are given a variation of a piece, they may be able to use their memory and adapt it and play it well. But if the variation is a critical variation that does not comply with the memory that they have, then they may not be able to play. And this is what I I'm showing here if there's variants of the virus, sometimes our immune system can still identify them, but if the variant occurs right on the place that we identified the spike protein, our immune system is not going to be able to deal with that infection. So in some cases, these variants could still produce disease even if we had created a memory response to the wild type or to other variants. The example with Munk would be if your art detectives identified the screaming face, which is a very typical image, but in his first sketch, it doesn't appear. So this would be like encountering a variant exactly on the piece of the spike protein that your immune system was identifying SARS-CoV-2 because now there's no screaming face and the piece that your immune system was recognizing is no longer there, it looks different, your immune system will not protect you. So same as with the R detectives, that the best detectives are trained, they do a lot of research, and they do chemical analysis, etc., so that they don't miss this potential variation of the same theme by Munk, and they can correctly identify it as an original Munk. How can we have the immune system trained into identifying variants that are infective, but it's still SARS CoV 2? How can we do that? The idea would be to generate a lot of responses to the whole spike protein so that if there's variations or variants, uh, one of your antibodies might miss identifying a particular variant, but the others identify other regions of the spike. And that way you can have multiple targets within the spike protein that are 
common to all the SARS-CoV-2 so that you can have a better immune response. How do we do this? The immune response is idiosyncratic and we cannot really say uh, how each one of us is going to react to the virus when we encounter it. So this is where the vaccines add a lot of value because they have been engineered to successfully present the appropriate pieces of the whole spike protein that are relevant for the T cell to now have several different specificity. So they're no longer going to just play the violin. Now you have created an orchestra that plays different pieces of that score and all of them play in harmony. So when you have several different variants, you have a multiple response driven by the vaccine. I am not explaining here details of the vaccine because there's several vaccine technologies, but all of them are attempting to do the same. How can we make the T cell identify more than just one piece? How can we create an amplification and better memory of this response to SARS-CoV-2? Are all the vaccines going to be able to identify the variants? Well, the variants are actually random. We cannot predict them. Uh, so far, the variants that have been identified seem to be identified by at least one of the vaccines, but that's probably because the research is ongoing for all the other vaccines. So vaccines may have the ability to identify the variants that are known today. Are they going to identify the variants in the future? We don't know. But the good news is that the technology for the vaccine production can now adapt to new variants. And when they are presenting to the T cell, if there's a particular variant that escapes that immune recognition, it can be incorporated very quickly into the new vaccine. So there's a lot of hope for the future. And fortunately, we have many different vaccines in development that will soon be an armamentarium for all of us to be protected against SARS-CoV-2 infection, which is COVID-19. These are the references that I'm using for this particular work, but I encourage you, if you're interested, uh, or if you want to go into more detail on the biology, take a look at other videos, uh, take a look at other more specific uh, publications, and please, uh, check my channel, subscribe, and see you soon. Stay safe and healthy.